Literary Gumbo. A continuing look at the world of writers, writing, publishers, and all other peripheral events. Uh, my name is Fred Klein. I'm the Chief Stirrer. And I have as a guest a very reticent, very quiet, retired star of many, many, many occasions here in Santa Barbara. You've noticed. Uh, <laughs> Shelley Lowenkoff. Welcome back, because I think you've been on this show more than almost anybody else. I count seven. Oh, you count seven? Yeah. I, that's more than I... All I can say, David Starkey at least serves <laughs> sandwiches. But, oh, <laughs> he does. Oh, well, well, but uh, but you had you had your choice I of get water. Exactly, a little amount of water, not a lot amount of water. We know we're not wasteful of water here. So let's talk because we're anyhow we're here about okay. a, how a hotel and, and an amazing hotel at that. But I don't know if you remember this, but I first met you at another iconic hotel. Get this. The Shoreham Hotel. Does that ring a bell for you? In Washington, in of course. Beautiful used to go downtown in, district. Th that's right. The big, the big. Uh, the, it was at the time uh, called the ABA, American Booksellers Association. Yeah. It still exists today. I don't well, know. Well, now called, it's called, called something BEA. Like it's called the BEA. BEA yeah. Book Exposition. Anyhow, America. this hotel we're we're celebrating is the Miramar Hotel, which was down. Down, down that away, below off 14th Street, off <laughs> off 101. But was the the fulcrum was the certainly the, the the center spot for probably all the interesting uh, theatrical and and literary uh, events that were happening. It was all, the blue all came roofs, out of there. The blue roofs, I remember. The those. blue roofs, yes. yes. I wonder if they're going to have the. They're going to install blue roofs because I've, I've seen when I came up by train recently, I saw the building and they are there are buildings. They still have a way to go, but they told me that officially they were opening January 9th, 19, I mean, 2019. You would think year. blue roofs. It's just an icon. And in fact, speaking about literary people yeah. here in Santa Barbara, Sue Grafton, Ken Millar, writing as Ross McDonald and Dennis Lenz, all three of them had mention of the Miramar and the Blue Oh, roofs. you mean in their books? In, in their, their books, books. Oh, really? absolutely. Really? That's how you could tell you were in Santa Barbara and say not Ventura or Goleta oh, because the Blue Roofs, oh, they, oh, didn't, they didn't allow them. Oh, it's right. like I mean, allowing you beyond 14th Street. It doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. I mean, it's too bad with Sue. Was Sue recently gone? Yeah, um, yeah. But oh, but anyhow, there it was the fulcrum. It was the place where everything happened. It was a magnet, and it was a very a, a nice, a, and they also it was laid back, unpretentious, uh, and therefore attracted a lot of people who had pretensions. Uh, but so we're going to talk about the the period. I'd say it was from 1975 to 2000. Yeah, is, until is that when they closed down for so, various reasons and the conference sort yeah, of... Then the con conference bounced away to, around... To... Um, a school. Yeah, to Westmont College. Westmont College. But anyhow, so it was up until that period. And we've been waiting for the hotel to return, to return, and it is finally going to happen. To bring the conference back to its former days of glory, right? Wouldn't but I you say? think... A, it was it was a period a, a really fascinating period, and the people who made it is what's what's really important, and that's why Shelley was part of that number one. Um, well, but Shelley and I are sort of going to trade uh, 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 na various stories. names mm -hmm. and maybe credits and maybe not credits. Well, here's here's the thing. My domain was the basement. I know that sounds terrible, but it was a huge and and. Um, really friendly basement under of, the of main the, auditorium, and that's where that's I had right. my workshop. It's and one of the reasons... It's called the Pirate Workshop. Was yeah, it called yeah. the Pirate Workshop? Yeah, it was. Pirate and, Workshop. And the reason for that is um, during the regular conference... The, the, the 9 to 5, so to Yeah, so it, it went 9 to 5, and somebody... You were on at night. Somebody goes to Barnaby Conrad and said, Hey! There's some people who are having a pirate workshop in the parking lot. 
meaning yes. that somebody is leading is trying to, a, a workshop to a yeah. of, of people and trying to lead a discussion. Uh -huh. and, but in the in the parking lot. And Conrad, being Conrad, said, well, we'll see about that. And that's how I got brought in. He said, you, now, you don't uh -huh. have to work in the parking lot. I'll get you inside. <laughs> but there we are. Uh -huh. So directly, that's directly under the auditorium. So my first story, and I know you'll appreciate this given we, we share interest in, in various kinds of, of music, but the speaker of the evening, which usually goes from about 7.30 till 9 o'clock yeah, at night, yeah, yeah. is one, let's see, he was born Arthur Arshosky, who uh, and he, he's known personally as Artie Shaw. Oh, so he's talking Irish. about his business in music, and he's talking about one of the great clarinetists, yeah. jazz jazz bands, and he's talking about a piano player he had who was a bit of a a bit of a nut, and he's saying this piano player one night said, "If I have to play Frenzy one more <laughs> time, I'm walking out." Ah. And Shaw's going, and I'm trying to think who that is, and. Uh, it just came out of me. I wasn't planning yeah. this. I said, Dodo Marmarosa. Oh, wow. Which happened to be correct. correct. Yeah. But Shaw stops and he says, Wollenkopf, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> because he said, nobody else would know that. Although he was a, a remarkable at, piano at, player. At, yeah. But there we are. And afterwards. But Shaw was, by that time, Shaw was really, you know, sort of a sour, sour puss, wasn't he? I would say more cranky, oh, cranky. <laughs> even, okay, but yeah. yeah, I can I can live with with yeah. sour so. puss, but but uh, there was that, and of course, I inherited my job at the conference from another great name in Santa Barbara, and that's Dennis Lenz, because he gave an e Dennis used to do the, the yeah oh I didn't yeah. know that and and uh, he gave one in the uh, late afternoon and then as I mentioned earlier somebody told Conrad they want uh, more and uh, Conrad said well we'll fix that he said I know somebody who never well, goes to did bed. Did you get additional money for doing that? I'll bet you got you got st stiff too like ever, like most people. Actually I can yeah. tell it now because most of the principles are, are gone but I, I did pretty well. Yeah? I did pretty well. Oh that's good that's good it, to know. It was in, it, there were other benefits. For instance, yeah. I would arrive, oh, at about 7 o'clock just to get ready for work, at which time upstairs in the dining room there was Mary Conrad who said, you've got to have the, the lamb chops. I said, <laughs> I, well, all right, I don't mind lamb chops. I love lamb chops. So I would order. So it became... Every year, I would arrive and have the lamb, lamb chops. chops. And she said, you know, this is the only place I feel comfortable eating lamb chops out. <laughs> okay, so there. I don't remember that the cuisine was that uh, special. We don't want to go there. <laughs> no, we, okay. But, but right. also, I would be, I would arrive early to yeah. um, get a little, well, liquid, liquid something libation. else in my coffee. I'd yeah. get a... a tall coffee and a shot of, of um, some brandy or cognac uh -huh. and it to uh, get me through. And one night when I arrive, um, here we are, the dining room by that time is empty. There are only two people in there. There is- Was the bar uh, attached? Oh, the bar? The bar yeah. is separate? No, the, the bar sort of fronted out on the, the dining room and okay, that's, that's right. where I was headed. Uh -huh. And I see these Two characters, both of whom look quite familiar. One of them, of course, is, is one of my dearest friends in the world, Mr. Conrad himself, uh -huh. and a great pal of his, Patrick Cunningham. Now, okay. the two, well, they're both published authors. and pa they, Patrick Cunningham? Patrick Cunningham, very much really? so. And they both have in common an interest in bullfighting. And uh -huh. in fact, Cunningham actually was, made it all the way through. He uh, was a bullfighter? Oh, yeah, a, a, a matador. Fought bull? Fought oh, bulls? more than one. Yeah. More than, many more than one. Uh -huh. So 
here we are, and um, Cunningham has pulled this. This is what reminds me. This cloth. Yeah. He has a red tablecloth, and it's that he uses as, the, as a cape. Yeah. And Conrad is the bull. The bull? Oh and no! He's holding the this is chairs. what time of the night? This is about. This is about seven thirty. Seven thirty at night, and, and, and uh, he's already he's already playing the bull. Yeah, and Conrad <laughs> is playing the bull, and uh -huh. it's you know and. Cunningham is doing a couple of passes, and I'm watching this. And finally, Cunningham says, "Stop! I want to substitute bullies." And, you're, and, and then he saw me, and he said, <laughs> "You, you, be, you be, be the bully." Be the bull. ah, I got a workshop to do, but there it is, just playing bull, and, uh -huh. and um, the the introduction of this whole new theme, and of course, very in, very offhandish, very yeah, no, nothing and, and pretentious, just, nothing, not at all, very, no, very no, down it, to earth. And you get the impression as was the place. Yeah, yeah this could have happened at, at any night, and, and uh -huh. indeed, in that same spirit, one night um, <laughs> I see a familiar figure who is sitting by herself, and she's finishing her dinner, and she nods to me and I, you know, how can you not recognize Julia Child? Uh -huh. So I stopped by to, to pay my respects and the next thing I know. She's not eating that. Yeah. Well, no, she, uh, I noticed that right away. I said, Julia, what's wrong? You're not, you're not eating. But she said, oh, I've come to see, and of course she came to see Mary Conrad. They were, they were, uh, they were related. They're related. Yeah. And yeah. so Mary arrives and she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm late. And uh, Julia said, well, you know, you conservatives, you're always a bit late for everything, aren't you? Because <laughs> Julia really, oh, um, she was, yeah, yeah, among she, oh, other she, things, she was very political. Oh, and very tough. She gave, at one point, I remember bad-mouthing um, the Food Network. And she said, how dare you do that? And she said, it's very early. It was many years ago. <laughs> they're just starting. They're trying out. They're trying to see what, what is successful, you know, what things to do. Don't just go rushing in and saying everything is terrible. No. no she told me that right away. Oh, no. She, is, she, yeah. she was, was a, she really a great, a great lady. stand up and, and, yeah. and a, a great lady. So uh, there are those. And then um, just to emphasize the diversity, one night, oh, this must have been about 10 o'clock. Uh -huh. So most of the non-serious people are gone, and I'm down. <laughs> the non-serious? Yeah. Oh, the, 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 the people who want to learn something. Yeah, yeah. The, the ones Those who, of us who paid money to learn something. Absolutely yeah, yeah. there to, to yeah. gather everything they can. And uh, my, my pirate workshops ran roughly from about and 9 o'clock at night until 4 in the morning. I, and I could never understand how you could survive all of that. Well, that, this is the point. They if, wouldn't stop. They would just keep uh, everybody wanting. They couldn't wait to read their stuff in front of you. Because the energy is, is so great. And how can you not reward that with, uh -huh. with your, your focus? Of course, it helped to have some coffee. And, uh -huh. and, uh -huh. Okay, so... This is about 10 or 10.30 at night, and I'm just kind of looking around toward the door, and I see a man standing there, and he's not moving, and he kind of looks like he came out of a B movie, which is to say black and white and grainy. You know, I'm looking at him. I know him from someplace, and he's even wearing a fedora, and he takes off the hat, and then he nods at me and he said, I'm just here to see how you handle yourself, kid. And I'm looking and it is John St. John, well known as Jigsaw John, John oh, who, yeah. while he was a homicide detective at the LAPD, had a badge with a number one on it. He, he was it. Why do I remember trying, to, somebody was trying to make a book out of yeah. this stuff. And would call me, and I was interested, but I, I never knew. Jane Howitt, does that ring a bell? Could be, yes, because yeah, yeah. I never knew what happened. Because it was such a, you know, he obviously was such an interesting oh, he, he character. Was, he was great. But somebody did it. Yeah, I mean, they did it. No, before. no, well, uh, never got. Here's, this is one of those horror stories <laughs> Sorry. of, of, of um, publishing. But your good friend and mine, and, and our associate Tony Lapopolo, actually got her a contract. 
Do oh yeah. For oh, uh, for, 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 for a book the, about for about so yeah, yeah, and yeah. And, um, and it she couldn't deliver is oh. basically what uh -huh. what happened. Uh -huh. it, it there were requests for revisions and uh -oh. for more a yeah. closer look and yeah. whatnot, and it just it just never quite gelled. But there was St. John, and he was standing there because uh, we'd certainly gone out drinking before, and he said, I want to show you some things, and we drove around L.A., and he said, I'm going to show you some dump sites, and I said, I know places to throw garbage, and he said, no, I'm talking about bodies. where people threw bodies. bodies. <laughs> uh, but there he is. He yeah. said, I just want to see how you handle yourself, kid. So there was never a book about him. I th oh, that's, that's, that's sad. No, and, that's and sad. there, there needs to be one, and so maybe Jane can pull it oh. together <laughs> and we'll hope. Yeah. But that, that's how you got connected. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, of course, there was another great member of the LAPD who used to hang around. PD. Oh. Yeah, LA, police. Yeah, department. no, but I'm trying to think of who. I'm trying to think. Joe Wombach, come on. Oh, Joe's, yeah, yeah. We had, he was an author. I thought of him as an author, not as a, <laughs> not as a cop. No, right well. But, but you're right. He had, but, yes, yes, he was very successful, Joseph Wombach. But the, the, is he still alive? Oh, very well. <laughs> I think Don't I let know, him hear that. You know, right? I know somehow I feel he's alive. He's certainly very yeah. much alive. He did a book a couple of years ago. You're right. He's, he began writing again. There was a period when he when when he wasn't doing anything. Well, I he think. was doing nonfiction, and then I remember once at the Miramar Hotel where he said, "You know, I got to stop this nonfiction stuff because I get sued too many times." You know, people. Uh -huh. he, he mentions. You say Fred Klein, and well, Fred Klein sues him. You know. Yeah, no, that hey, I know. No. But that that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, no, he wrote. Yes, he wrote. He was the first one to your first non-cop. Right. I thought it non-cop to be able to get the inside in the inside of of a cop. Well, he and then and then uh, the, the the famous one. Uh, the, what he wasn't famous. Come on, give no, me a brand joke. Of course, much, he was. much more famous than the one I'm trying to bring up. Uh, Serpico, Serpico. Oh, oh Good yeah. Thing of Serpico. Yeah, yeah, but Serpico was just a one, one. Yes, book. and was his own was his, that own was his story. His yeah. only book, but Wamba was, you know, all of these things. He was a person, a cop, yeah. a writer, and he went he went through all three, and he had such great stories, yeah. and a lot of them came out. I remember getting one in the Miramar Hotel where he's still in uniform. He's got his sergeant stripes on and he's got an appointment in the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles with the then editor of the Atlantic Monthly, Edward Weeks. Yeah. And, and uh, Weeks has written to him and said, I'm going to be in Los Angeles and um, I've enjoyed some of your short stories and, and uh, I'd love to meet you. And Wamba tells the stories. He, he, he I uh, adjust my tie and I go up to it because I'm meeting the editor in chief of the, oh, Atlantic, the Atlantic Monthly, Monthly at, at right? a time when it was it, well, it is has become a real cultural organ now. But at the time, it was literary uh -huh. cultural, I'm and so, so he's, yeah. he's really respectful. And Weeks greets him. He's in his bathrobe and he's got. Uh, so, uh, uh, tissue paper from his uh, shaving cut and right. whatnot, but he said, oh, come in, my dear fellow, uh, sit down. And he is talking to Wamba about his short stories and saying, you know, you're really good at this, and I suspect you're very good at being a policeman, but most people can't be good at two things, and I suggest that you become good at being a writer. That's, 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 that's see, interesting. See, that, yeah, so yeah. Uh, that sort of passes through in, in, in the um, Biltmore, and you, yeah. you get all of these wonderful things. But, uh, uh, now talk about um, a couple of those characters there. Well, There's uh, a photograph in the beginning of this, of this sort of reminiscent book Bill with a shot Downey, of, Bill Downey. Bill Downey. See, he was my first friend in... Santa Barbara, and the way I had met him, um, this goes back into late 60s, maybe early, at the most early, no, late 60s yeah. for sure. Back and, in New York? And uh, I'm 
editor-in-chief of a publishing house in Los Angeles that you know well because as you are fond of oh. telling people, I brought you your first million reprint. Uh, the sex the, manifesto the, of, of the, the new generation. generation. The Harrod experiment. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here I am and Downey is sent to me by a local agent. Uh -huh. And okay, a local agent, and so I read the material, and it's wonderful, except there's just one problem. There's no story. Oh. It's, it's, it's engaging, and it's one of those things, you, I'm sure you get these, where you, have, you find yourself reading it, thinking any minute there's gonna be a story, and I'm really caught up in it. Uh -huh. So I had a meeting with Bill, and, um, we started talking and talking about revising it and about some of his other work, and we discovered that we both had a fondness for a particular type of dog, a blue tick coon hound. A what? what? A blue tick coon hound. No, no. They, uh, their whole purpose in life is to tree animals like, like raccoons. <laughs> or bears or, or whatnot, Jeez. and they sit at the bottom and they go, Woo! And oh, so that their owner knows, hey, I've treated a coon. So that started our Can't friendship, he's, he's and it. then I moved to Santa Barbara, and I looked up Bill, and uh, our friendship just... What, what, he was teaching out at UCSB, or was it City College? It was, it was at City College, but he was also working as a reporter for the news press. And oh. I would meet him sometimes. He, he had a manual typewriter in the back of his car, and during lunch, he'd oh, wow. like that, and writing and fiction. And then we'd go to Joe's, which was walking distance from the news press on Thursdays because they had ham hocks oh. and lima beans. And, yeah. and then uh, it turns out that Bill Downey came from the same place in Iowa as our local, and he also appeared in the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, uh, Kenneth Rexroth, the poet. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, uh, neither of us have said that because we just take Bill as Bill, but Bill happens to be African American, and of course Rexroth isn't, so uh -huh. the two of them are, and I would be in the middle sometimes when they were talking about Ottumwa, Iowa, and how well, on our side of the coming. country was this. Well, we always did. Yeah. And then the three of us would get into some of the raunchiest and most despicable um, limericks. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so you know, there once was a girl from Nantucket. Oh, okay. and I won't right. go any right. farther right. than right. that. But uh, but Rexwath always won. He said he looks at Bill and he said, "You just." Think you're obscene. <laughs> so wait, to keep on. We're now we've got we're, uh, we're time is going, and, uh, and we've got we we've got about five minutes left. We've got to do a few more. People. Time goes well. Okay, there's Paul, your old Paul, Paul Lazarus. Lazarus. Well, talk talk yeah. Paul Lazarus. Yeah, Paul Lazarus. Who got me the Santa Writers Conference? Paul, you know, no matter how hot or how cold it was, how inclement the weather was, or or how busy. Paul was, he always looked as though he had put on a fresh shirt and had, had come from a dry cleaner and everything was, was pressed. He, was all, he always had that uh -huh. presence and, and uh, people would say things like, Paul, you're born to lead. And he said, don't I know it. You know, I mean, he, um, he was number two man to Jerry Wald yeah, at, at yeah. Columbia, Columbia Studio. Yeah. And of course, that was one of Sa his. Samuel, I still can't think of the, the director's name that I, that I was thinking that, that Paul was involved in. Samuel. But, and the first name was Samuel, a director, and I can't think of it, who directed a, a, a big pictures in Europe, seldom in America. Anyhow, I'm not helping. No. Because I want to go. This is, incidentally, some of this is happening. He sounds like everything's happening at the bar. But some of this is happening no, in at, workshops at, at as workshop, well. right? Well, well, you were every every night. You had, I don't still don't know how you could stand it, but um, how you had you your, your pirate workshop. But but uh, uh, again, in terms of Schultz, uh, 
Was oh, Sparky. Sparky oh, Schultz well, used that, to be there at and, yours. And here's, here's the interesting. That's Charlie, Charlie at, Schultz. At one point. Peanuts. Uh, yeah, I'm sitting at a table, and there's, there's um, Sparky, Charles Schultz, and Bob Kane of Batman fame. Oh. And, you know, and they're both saying, you got anything coming up in the next uh, couple of years or something? You know, we'll be happy to give you blurbs. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. But, and these two guys yeah. uh, are, are iconic because I grew up with Batman uh -huh. and gravitated to uh -huh. Peanuts. Uh -huh. and, and but the thing about Sparky Charles Schultz was that he was such a fantastic reader. And every time I'd see him, I'd say, "What are you reading? What do you have? You read this?" And he'd have oh, he and he was up to date on what was what was. He was not only up to date, but <clears throat> he didn't want anything to do with people who didn't read. They would come to him and say, "May I have your autograph, Mister?" He said, "What are you reading?" And I said, uh, "Well, I, I." He said, "That's that's interesting. That's interesting." Uh, yeah, very, very uh, much so. Uh -huh, that, that. Uh -huh. and so, Alex Haley. Uh, well, a great pal that's a, that, that, of Conrad from the San Francisco days. Oh, is that how we're going? Alex Haley, who wrote Roots, yeah, which became for at its time the number one uh, and movie, was, book, whatever of, of the period. And the one time I heard it's, Conrad... Uh, it's being redone now, incidentally, yeah, you know. Yeah, they're, I think they're doing it now for whites. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But, but the one time I heard Barnaby Conrad raise his voice at all was to Alex Haley saying, when are you going to get off your ass and write the story of your family? And oh, really? Says, well, before, I thought he was a, a success when, you know, before he came to the writers. Oh, oh well, yeah, when he, by the time he came to it, oh, but yeah, it was, back in the day yeah. when they were first hanging out. Uh -huh. And so Conrad would say, you're nothing if you don't put that down, because look at all the people you would be letting oh, down yeah, yeah. by not telling the story. And he said, I'm doing it, Barney, I'm doing it. And Barnaby would say, but not enough. Uh-huh. You know, he, he, he well, really... Well, you, you look what's hot today. Yeah, you, yeah, he really had a hand in that. And uh, see, right, Yeah, the beginning. The beginning and, of all the black, the, the oh, opening up of the whole black... Well... Be, because movement. before that we had Chester Himes, of, of, of course, yeah, and then oh, we then had the, the Ralph Ellison in The Invisible Man. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. here's the thing, as James long as Baldwin. we're on the subject of, of the Miramar and the clock yeah. is ticking, in some ways Conrad typified the, the Miramar because he knew everybody uh -huh. and he... Yeah, he was he, the, the provocateur. He in was, a sense. and he knew exactly yeah. what to say to to get them talking, and they came to be with, with him, him yeah. and to to even talk when to he him. wasn't sober, even when you know those those evening nights when it, did, it didn't matter. Kids. He just radiated the same kind of happiness.